the royal kingdom is rich with pageantry, tradition, and pomp and circumstance. Up and down the length of the country are examples of how the history of these islands is interlaced with that of the monarchy. Nowhere is that more evident than in the nation's capital, London. It is here that some of the greatest state occasions in our nation's life, the pomp and circumstance of state funerals, royal weddings, and of course, the coronation itself takes place. Westminster Abbey and the Palace of Westminster provide the backdrops and settings to some of the most important state occasions in our nation's life. Throughout the pomp and ceremony of events such as the coronation service and the annual state opening of Parliament, there are numerous images, symbols and messages depicting the relationship between the monarchy and the country. Of the two buildings we can see today, Westminster Abbey is in fact the older. It was started by Edward the Confessor in the 11th century. Edward had wanted to make a pilgrimage to the tomb of St. Peter in Rome, but had been prevented from going by his advisers, who feared disorder in his absence. So instead, he built a great church here in London, dedicated to St. Peter, which would be used as his burial place. The Confessor's Church was actually built on the site of one that had been here since the 7th century. And there's a legend about the consecration of the original St. Peter's. The story goes that one evening, as the sun started to dip behind the hills, two fishermen were casting their nets on the Thames when they were beckoned to by a shadowy figure on the southern shore. Slowly they rowed over to him and he asked them for a passage across to Thorny Island. On the journey, the stranger revealed that he too was a fisherman and that he had come to dedicate the church that was to bear his name. The two locals were dubious of the stranger's tale until he left their boat and entered the church. At that point, they were bathed in a heavenly light because, it was claimed, the stranger was St. Peter coming back to earth for the dedication service. Soon after this event, Edred, one of the fishermen, was rewarded with a prized catch of salmon. Edward the Confessor's church was designed in the Norman style. Edward's mother was from Normandy and he spent much of his early life in exile there. However, it was perhaps also a sign of things to come. When Edward died in January 1066, he left neither successor nor instructions on whom should succeed. One of the claimants to the throne was William, Duke of Normandy. In September 1066, William landed at Pevensey Bay, defeated Harold at the Battle of Hastings and was duly acknowledged as king. William then deliberately chose to be crowned in the church Edward had so recently consecrated, thus beginning an unbroken tradition of all English and British monarchs. By far the greatest effect of the Crown's close association with Westminster Abbey has been to make it the nation's church. While countless events in the nation's life are celebrated within these spectacular vaulted arches, the most vivid demonstration of this role is the coronation service. Will you solemnly promise and swear to govern the people of the United Kingdom of Great Britain. One of the other effects of having such a close association with the Crown is that many of the Abbey's most historic features from its monastic past have uniquely survived the ravages of time and reform. Beneath us here is a room called the Pick's Chamber, which is the oldest area of the Abbey. 
The Pix Chamber is a vaulted room, dates from the 11th century, and it was originally used as a chapel. And it is in the Pix Chamber that we have one of the earliest altars of the Abbey, an early stone altar. After that, though, from the 14th century, it was used for the monastic uh, treasury and also the, a large chest called the Pix, which gave the room its name, was also kept in this chamber. The Pix used to contain all the standard um, gold and silver coinage of the realm, and so obviously this room had to have a very good security system to keep it all safe. The huge oak door to the Pix chamber has six locks in it. Each one um, had a separate key, and each key was looked after by a separate person. So it was pretty secure in that aspect, because you had to have all those six people together to enable you to open the door. And on the outside of the door, in the cloister, there is a stone sill which um, is in the floor, and it means that the door to the Pix chamber can't open fully. It will only open enough to let a person go in and out of the room, but not sufficiently to let those huge wooden chests um, come in and out. So it was pretty fail-safe as far as, far as security was concerned. garden is said to be uh, the oldest garden in this country. Uh, it's thought to have been um, under continuous cultivation for 900 years and it's where the infirmer of the abbey or the physician of the abbey when it was a monastery would have grown plants and herbs for the care of the sick. The abbey has been a place of people um, finding sanctuary really since the end of the 12th century and criminals could come to the abbey precincts and they could claim sanctuary, they could take refuge from the law as long as their crimes were not anti-church and they were not um, treasonable. And um, even though the laws of sanctuary were abolished in the early 17th century, even by 1830, the whole area around the abbey was still known as the Devil's Acre because of the um, rather undesirable people who lived in the area. There is another part of London whose name was the only clue to its connection with Westminster Abbey. Covent Garden used to be Convent Garden and was where the monks from the abbey kept their livestock and grew everything from fruit to vegetables to cereal crops. This room is known as the Chapter House. It's the second largest of its kind in England after Lincoln and is possibly the most important administrative building in the Abbey's story. The name derives from the practice whereby the monks would gather here after Mass to hear a chapter of the Benedictine rule read aloud. However, this was also where, for 200 years in the 14th century, the Parliament met. It was Edward VI who first made the old chapel of St. Stephen in the Palace of Westminster available for their use. From then on, it was the palace which increasingly became associated with Parliament. Until then, the Palace of Westminster had been a royal residence, indeed the oldest royal palace in London. For nearly 500 years, from the confessor to Henry VIII, the Crown and Parliament had existed within the same set of buildings. From now on, the two institutions were to grow further apart, indeed to the point at which Parliament summoned the King here to be tried and convicted of high treason. There have been three palaces on this site, but sadly nothing remains of the first, which dated back to the days of King Canute. There's hardly anything left of the second, built by Edward the Confessor. The present palace was built after a terrible fire destroyed the old palace in 1834. In those days, the exchequer used notched tally sticks as a form of account, which every now and then had to be destroyed. On this particular occasion, the heat in the furnaces burning the tally sticks became so intense that it set light to the old wooden palace. 
fire was probably a blessing in disguise, for the Confessor's old palace was not really designed for the machinery of parliamentary government. Sir Charles Barry won the ensuing competition to design the new Houses of Parliament, selecting a perpendicular Gothic style in keeping with Westminster Abbey. The foundation stone of the new Parliament House was laid in 1840, and the last part, the Victoria Tower, then the highest tower in the whole world, was finished in 1860. The completed building was allowed to retain its old name and status as a royal palace. It had 1,100 rooms, 100 staircases and three miles of corridors, and covered an area of eight acres. It cost over two million pounds in total or 200 million pounds in today's money. The clock tower, or Big Ben as it's better known, was completed in 1859. The nickname comes from this huge bell which chimes the hour. And just to give you a sense of the scale, it's seven foot six inches high, nine feet across, and weighs 13 tons. The original bell came from tying tears, but broke before it was hung in the tower. So it was recast at the oldest foundry in London, the Whitechapel Bell Foundry. The clapper was too big, and within a couple of months, it had cracked the bell. They modified the clapper, rehung the bell, and it still chimes to this day, complete with crack. Very few people know that a third of the way up this famous clock tower is a prison room, known as the number one room. Members of either the House of Commons or the Lords or anyone else for that matter who misbehaved during a debate, could well have found themselves locked up in here. The suffragette Emmeline Pankhurst was incarcerated here for a brief spell. And although people are still threatened with it today, it was perhaps surprisingly last used for an MP over 100 years ago, in 1880. The two Houses of Parliament, Lords and the Commons, evolved over many centuries. The word parliament simply means an assembly or council, and in this case it referred to a mixture of nobles and lords gathered at the behest of the monarch. Interestingly, the name of the commons does not signify the common people. It actually refers to all the local communities, the counties and towns in the kingdom, which the House of Commons explicitly represents. The opening ceremony of Parliament customarily took place in the King's presence in the Painted Chamber. In spite of all the upheavals of history, it still takes place today and is one of the most spectacular but also one of the least understood pieces of royal pageantry, the state opening of Parliament. Parliament has no idea, theoretically, why it has been assembled. And if you look back over the centuries, when Parliament gathered representatives from all over England, and they arrived in London. They had no idea why their king had summoned them. They'd received this writ saying, under pain of death, you will attend upon me at my palace at Westminster, where I will tell you, as your sovereign, what I want you to do. And these representatives were often in a great deal of awe of that document. And they had no idea whether they were going to be asked to raise ridiculous amounts of money for sovereigns to go off and claim more and more thrones around Europe, which were extremely expensive they would arrive at Parliament, and the Sovereign would arrive in state, sit on the throne and say, I have summoned you here because. And right up to today, the tradition goes on. But now we have a constitutional monarchy. There's still a state opening of Parliament. The Crown has still summoned her representatives to Parliament, and they're still coming into the Chamber of the House of Lords to hear why the Sovereign has called them, but the Sovereign now speaks with the words of her Prime Minister and her Cabinet. In the early times when kings went to war, uh, they had around them sergeants at arms, people who stayed extremely close with arms, which were large club-like 
weapons called maces. And with those maces, they would make sure that anyone who tried to get close to the monarch could be clubbed on the head and sent packing. The mace is derived from a medieval close quarter battle weapon such as this. From as far afield as Spain to Mughal India, it became accepted as a symbol of office. It ceremonially represented the power delegated by the ruler to the person who carried it. At the start of each sitting day in the House of Commons, the speaker enters the chamber preceded by the sergeant at arms carrying the mace. Without the mace being present on the table of the Commons, the House would not be properly constituted. For all the Gothic splendor of Bowery's Palace of Westminster, perhaps one of the least known treasures and most important surviving parts of the original palace is Westminster Hall. It was built around 900 years ago when William Rufus, William the Conqueror's son, was king. It was thought to be the largest hall in Europe, but staggeringly the king was disappointed with its size, protesting the great hall to be a mere bedchamber. The hammer beam roof is slightly more recent. It dates from Richard II's reign at the end of the 14th century, but that doesn't detract from the scale and prescience of its original achievement. It's a magnificent 240 feet long and has the widest unsupported ceiling span in the country. The hall is often used for great ceremonies. Since 1099, monarchs have held coronation festivals here. A banquet would be held in the hall when traditionally the king's champion, a knight on horseback, would ride to the center of the hall in full armor. There he would throw down his gauntlet to challenge anyone to single combat for disputing the king's right to succeed. The last time that actually happened was when a coronation festival was held here in 1821 for George IV. Not surprisingly, it was also the scene of many famous trials, including perhaps the most extraordinary of all, that of King Charles I. Seven years after his attempt to arrest five members of parliament on charges of treason against him, he found himself being brought to trial for treason against the state. The trial lasted for seven days in January 1649. Judges were commissioners appointed by the Commons, but Charles refused to accept the authority of the court, even keeping his hat on throughout the proceedings. The king was found guilty of treason. Death by execution is the punishment, and Charles was given no chance to speak against his sentence. His death warrant was signed by Oliver Cromwell, amongst others, and the date for the beheading was set for the 30th of January, 1649, outside the front of the banqueting house of Whitehall Palace. The king was to suffer at his own door. The building epitomized, in a sense, the spirit of Charles and the Stuarts. Charles I had built up a magnificent art collection here, with over 460 paintings which were later dispersed during the Commonwealth era. But the banqueting house still contains the largest and most spectacular work by Rubens. And it was in this room that the king staged expensive and spectacular masks, the theatrical experiences of the day. The accounts of one such mask show expenses of over 500 pounds for the king's costume alone, which equates to around 75,000 pounds in today's terms. Now it was to be the backcloth for a scene very different to the dramas which had previously taken place here. The day before the execution, his two youngest children, 13-year-old Princess Elizabeth and 9-year-old Henry, Duke of Gloucester, were brought to Charles at St. James's Palace to say goodbye. On the day of the execution, the barrier around the scaffold was draped in black cloth so that the crowd would see nothing but the swift descent of the axe. Meanwhile, a small procession set out across St. James's Park to Whitehall, 
king was surrounded by an escort of soldiers carrying pikes. It was a bitterly cold day, and crowds gathered to watch silently, some on neighboring rooftops. They marveled at the king's courage and dignity. Charles wore three shirts to prevent him from getting cold and shivery, which the crowd might mistake for fear. He was brought into this room and then walked the length of it under the ceiling he had commissioned. He stepped out onto the scaffold from a window. He instructed the executioner to wait until he was ready, when he would stretch out his arms. When the axe fell, the crowd let out a terrible moan. The banqueting house that we see today is in fact the third. This version, with its Reuben ceiling and finery, was begun in 1619, on the same site as the previous house, and it is almost exactly the same size. Its modern appearance dates from the early 19th century when it was refaced. The palace started as the London residence of Henry VIII's first Archbishop of York, otherwise known as Cardinal Wolsey. Wolsey was one of Henry's closest advisers and the Chancellor for 14 years, during which time he became one of the most powerful and wealthy men in the kingdom. Wolsey furnished York Place with a lavish splendor, but in a way he did too good a job and made it a most desirable residence. And although King Henry was renowned for owning more palaces than any other monarch, he was actually in need of a central London base. Well, Henry VIII had a terrible crisis in 1512 because his principal palace burnt down. That was Westminster Palace, and he'd got nowhere to go. And it was a crisis that he could only resolve by actually staying over the river with the Archbishop of Canterbury in um, Lambeth Palace. And this went on for about 15, 20 years until eventually Cardinal Wolsey, who had been made Archbishop of York, um, was forced to leave his house, York Place, which subsequently became Whitehall Palace. And what Henry VIII did was took York Place from the Cardinal as he fell and turned it into his own palace, thus solving the problem that he'd had since 1512. After the death of Queen Elizabeth, uh, Whitehall had become really quite run down. In her later years, Elizabeth more or less ignored all sort of building maintenance. And James I came from Scotland. He was staying in a very small, very um, unglamorous palace, actually, in Scotland. He came down. He, he must have thought he'd won the jackpot. I mean, it's unbelievable. He came to this incredible palace, huge, wonderful building, slightly decayed. But what he thought he'd do is start to develop it and actually start to turn it into something even more magnificent. And the banqueting house was the very first part of that. When James I built the banqueting house, he really intended to be the first part of a complete scheme to totally rebuild Whitehall Palace. But there were terrible financial problems in his reign, and he was unable to do it. And when Charles I came to the throne, he actually commissioned Inigo Jones to design a massive replacement for the whole of Whitehall Palace. But as we know, Charles I ran into a little bit of difficulty and was really completely unable to do anything. But what's fascinating is that while he was in imprisonment in um, Carisbrook Castle on the Isle of Wight, he summoned Inigo Jones to his prison cell. And in his prison cell, he sat down with the architect and tried to design more buildings at Whitehall, which really shows that really as late as that, the king was thinking about coming back to Whitehall and rebuilding it. Charles II had the same ambition. He wanted to rebuild it as well. And in, in fact, eventually, the only person who may have had any success here was James II. And of course, he left um, England in disgrace just as his buildings were rising from the foundations. Sadly, Whitehall is a lost palace, for in 1698 it caught fire. Over 1,000 apartments were destroyed. On a fateful um, day in 1698, a maid was drying linen over a charcoal brazier. Um, she left the room, and the palace went up in, in, in flames. And whatever they tried to do to stop it, it failed. They got big barrels of gunpowder um, to blow up bits of the building to make a fire break, and all the gunpowder did was actually set more bits of the building alight. And ultimately, the only part of the building to be saved was the banqueting house. The fire of 1698 damaged so much 
as it effectively ended the role of the palace in the story of the crown. The court moved instead to another of Henry VIII's residences, here at St. James's. The magnificent Tudor gatehouse faces up to St. James's Street, rarely seen by many, as the road is now one way up the hill and away from the palace. However, it gave access to and from the bustling commercial village which grew up around the court. In the early days, it was peddlers, traders and farmers. By the 1700s, it was coffee houses and specialist shops, sports and gaming houses. The layout, certainly the courtyards, are exactly the same as they were when Henry VIII built it. It was the Stuarts who used it intensively. Charles I lived here, and his sons, Charles II and James II, played here as children. There was no mal, therefore they played in the park a great deal, so that when Charles I went to his execution, he was able to point to trees in the park that his sons had climbed. After the restoration, Charles II came back here, and it was in his, in his heart, I think, to bring back those childhood memories of his games in the park, and yet to erase the tragic memory of his father's walk across that park to his death, that he created birdcage walk. It literally, he had bird cages in all the trees. All the beauties that we see in St. James Park now were created by Charles II, almost in memory of his father. In this way, St. James's Park became the first royal park. During the Civil War in 1642, the younger son of Charles I, Prince James, was captured at the Battle of Edgehill. James was captured by Cromwell, and he brought him back here as a prisoner. Now, this was no ordinary boy. He decided to play games with his jailers and the other children, and they played hide-and-seek every evening. Gradually, James made it last longer and longer, found odd places to hide. Who would know that garden better than James for hiding? And the jailers, the, 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 the Cromwell's men, weren't at all perturbed when it took longer and longer to find him. And then one evening, James locked up his dog in case it followed him got the key from the gardener, slipped out of the gate into what is now the five-lane mall, and escaped down river. And it was apparently half an hour before the jailers realized he wasn't just hiding, he had gone. With his head start, James was able to board a ship for the continent, returning to England only when his elder brother Charles II regained the throne. After Charles had returned from exile, he asked Le Nôtre, a famous French landscape architect, responsible for the Tuyer and Versailles gardens, to lay out a design for the park. However, Nôtre refused to disturb a place of such natural beauty, and Charles extended it by 36 acres and restored it to its former glory, planting it with fruit trees, stocking it with deer, and he built a tree-lined avenue with powdered cockle shells where he could play a game very similar to modern-day bowls called Pell-Mell. No one plays Pell-Mell anymore, but the name of one of London's most famous roads still bears its name. The canal in the middle of St. James's Park became one of Charles II's favorite spots, and he could often be seen accompanied by his mistresses, walking his dogs around it and sometimes even swimming in it. The present park and the layout of the Mall is largely the result of more recent times, the work of George IV. But George also had huge plans to seriously change the face of the capital by constructing a palace in Regent's Park and a triumphal route, or Regent Street, to his London residence, Carlton House. Due to the huge rising cost, George IV was forced to abandon his grandiose plans, which would have changed the nature of this part of the country. Instead, he opted to turn Buckingham House into a palace. Before it became a royal property, there had already been three houses on the site. Um, the original house was built in the 1630s by Lord Goring. He built a little brick house facing south, not facing over the park. 
Um, that burnt down. And then it was, the site was bought by Lord Arlington, who rebuilt the house after the restoration in the 1670s. Um, and he, in turn, sold that house to the Duke of Buckingham. Um, the Duke of Buckingham was extremely ambitious, and as well as the Mulberry Garden, he wanted to lay out a great forecourt in front facing over the park, just you know, on the site of the present forecourt of the palace. Um, and that was actually crown property because it was part of the park. So he was squatting, you know, he was sort of um, encroaching into the park. Um, but it was made right and he was given a lease, but the lease expired in the middle of the 18th century. It was acquired for George III after he came to the throne and after his marriage in 1761. Um, and it was a series of circumstances. Um, the part of the property was Crown lease, and the lease came up at that time, and that enabled um, the, you know, the Crown estate to acquire um, the whole property. And George III, newly married, wanted a private house of his own, but was in, away from St James's Palace, which was the old royal palace. Um, and this provided a perfect opportunity. It, wasn't a large house. I mean, some of them, or particularly grand. I mean, some of the money was spent making it less grand. For instance, before George III acquired it, there was a very elaborate forecourt in front with a fountain and railings. They were all taken away, um, and so on with the house. I mean, there were statues on the roof which were taken off. So it was made, you know, more like a modest private house. George III had no fewer than thirteen children. He obviously had to make room for them all but he also had a passion for his library. He collected books, and um, books tend to grow as well, and so he kept adding libraries on. So on one side of, of the palace, on the north side, he was adding rooms for the children, and on the south side, he was adding on rooms for the library. And he ended up with huge, a huge library, I mean, sort of 60 or 70,000 books um, in four separate rooms. the books had the better rooms than the children while it was a private house. But it was one of those children, George IV, who, when he became king, began the transformation from Buckingham House to the palace that we know today. George IV started a major building program, which was only completed after his death. By the only part of the house which still exists today is this wall and fireplace just inside the grand entrance. The majority of the conversion was designed and carried out by John Nash, although not completed by him. He exceeded his budget by so much he was taken off the job. The building has never been a particularly popular one. William IV never liked it, and when the old Palace of Westminster, which had been used as a permanent home for Parliament since 1550, burnt down in 1834, the King offered Buckingham Palace as a new home. Parliament refused, and the palace became the accepted official London residence of the monarch. William was therefore forced to carry on the work his brother George IV had begun. Queen Victoria was equally unimpressed with the building, and even more with the bureaucratic staffing arrangements. For instance, to have a fire required three departments. The parks and foresters to supply the wood, the housekeepers to clean and lay it, and the master of the households to light it. Originally, the palace had a three-sided open courtyard and in the front was a huge gateway modelled on the famous arch in Rome. Much of the intended effects and grandeur of the palace was lost because during Queen Victoria's reign, a new wing was built across the front of the courtyard, creating a quadrangle. So they removed the archway and had it placed at the top end of Hyde Park. This is what we now call Marble Arch, and of course it's still there today. Standing inside the quadrangle today, the difference between the old and the new is very obvious. The present facade is even more recent. Originally, the palace had an Italian stucco stone facade, which collapsed due to pollution, 
and in 1913, George V commissioned Aston Webb to replace it with the familiar Portland stone facade which we know so well today. At about the same time, the railings, the Queen's Gardens and the Victoria Memorial were completed to create a whole new frontage. Buckingham Palace is now one of the must-see locations at the very top of any visitor to London's list. But alongside the palace is a list of more modern attractions in Kensington that owe their existence to the monarchy. The Science Museum, the Victoria and Albert Museum, the Royal Albert Hall, the Imperial College of Science, the Natural History Museum, the Royal College of Music, were all inspired by Queen Victoria's consort, which is the key reason why the Albert Memorial is here at the heart of an area that could be called Albertropolis in his honor. Considering Prince Albert only lived in the country for a mere 20 years, this area of Kensington is a truly remarkable testimony to his imagination and energy. Yet there is no evidence of the one idea from which all this stems, the Great Exhibition of 1851. The concept was both revolutionary and highly controversial. Even now, it's difficult to imagine that they really proposed building a giant fan and glass conservatory in this part of Hyde Park and then turning it into the greatest trade show the world had ever seen. At first, there was a public outcry when Queen Victoria gave permission for Hyde Park to be used as its site. People felt that the whole area would become a bivouac of all vagabonds. They were afraid that Kensington would become uninhabitable. A competition was held to find a design for the exhibition building, and 230 entries were received. Joseph Paxton won with a design based on a conservatory at Chatsworth House. Over 2,000 men were employed to construct a monumental building made from 4,000 tons of iron and 400 tons of glass, which incorporated the trees in the park. However, the building was overrun by a plague of sparrows which no one could remove. They couldn't shoot them because of the glass. It was the Duke of Wellington who proposed a solution to the Queen. Try Sparrowhawks, ma'am. Once built, it was necessary to test whether the Crystal Palace could withstand the thousands of expected visitors. Squads of soldiers were marched in in order to jump up and down, shouting at the tops of their voice. The Queen, of course, came to the official opening and, and several times beforehand to see how it was going. Um, the British section was very highly organized with, with a classification system of, of 36 sections, um, ranging from everything from, from very heavy machinery uh, to um, the products that people use in their ordinary life, china, uh, stationery, clothes, and so forth. Um, and the, 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 the them section, the foreign section, it was simply too difficult to arrange that within the uh, 36 classifications, so each nation was given uh, the, the amount of space it needed, and they showed all their stuff muddled up together. When the exhibition closed five months later, it had been visited by more than six million people. The following year, Crystal Palace was taken down and re-erected in Sydenham in South London. Sadly, it was destroyed by a fire in 1936, but the area still takes its name. The exhibition was a huge success, and Albert was given a title of consort for his involvement with it. A profit of £186,000 was made, a huge and completely unforeseen fortune for the time. Albert used the money to fulfill one of his dreams. He devised a concept for an establishment which would apply art and science to industrial pursuits. First thing he needed was a plot of land. There were expanses of market gardens not far from the site of the exhibition in, in Hyde Park, um, stretching down the hill towards Brompton, and they decided to buy up a, a lot of land here. And that's the land on which the Victoria and Albert Museum now stands and the other museums of South Kensington. Prince Albert's idea was that this land would be a great cultural centre for London and he wanted to group all sorts of cultural organisations on it. His first choice was the National Gallery, but the National Gallery wouldn't move um, and that held things up for a number of years. The Albert Hall was a project like the Great Exhibition where public subscriptions were sought as the financial basis of the thing and they were only able to get enough money by uh, selling the rights to the seats and to the boxes. 
Victoria bought 20 seats, which make up the present royal box, and the commissioners for the 1851 exhibition, who were still the landlords of the hall, promised the site at a peppercorn rent of one shilling a year. The hall was designed from the inspiration which Cole had taken from the Roman amphitheatres. Facing the Great Hall is a gilded memorial to Prince Albert, which was designed by George Gilbert Scott. The site of the memorial was carefully chosen. It stands on the bisecting point of two lines, one that runs through the site of the Great Exhibition and one that runs through the heart of Albatropolis. The Queen took a close personal interest in the building of the memorial, and although, rather strangely, she never expressed an opinion of the finished work, Scott was knighted for his efforts. Unlike the hall, though, the memorial never had an official unveiling ceremony. Albert is shown reading a catalogue from the 1851 exhibition, with emblems and motifs of his influences and interests surrounding him. Victoria made rather a habit of renaming the places she was asked to visit. In 1899, a new extension was needed for the South Kensington Museum, and the Queen laid the foundation stone. It was one of the last official duties of her reign, and it seems appropriate that she chose to rename it the Victoria and Albert Museum. It was also her final opportunity to pay tribute to her beloved husband and their life together. One of the main features Victoria would have seen when visiting the museum was the cast courts. These contain replicas of famous pieces of architecture and statues from around the world. They were assembled for the benefit of art students who were seldom able to travel to the actual works themselves. A magnificent replica of Michelangelo's David still stands as it would have done at the time of Victoria's visit, the only difference being that he no longer wears a fig leaf. The leaf had been specially designed and added in order to avoid the Queen's embarrassment. There is another reason that Queen Victoria always had a special affection for Kensington. It was her birthplace and childhood home. She was born at Kensington Palace on the 24th of May, 1819. Her father died nine months after her birth, and so she was brought up by her mother and by her governess, Louise Lazon, under a strict regime. Her life here was simple, consisting mainly of schooling, walking, and family meals. She had a passion for ponies, and would often be seen riding in a little trap through Kensington Gardens. Although she describes her childhood as lonely, she always had a great fondness for the palace. As a young teenager, Victoria was made quietly aware of how close she was to the throne when her mother inserted a page into a book on English kings and queens. It added the names of her uncles and then her own. When Victoria found the book, she is reported to have wept, raised a finger and said, I will be good. She commissioned a man called Wilkie to paint the, uh, uh, the accession council. And, and it's a very accurate reflection of the room, the Red Saloon here, and it has the looking glass in its position, it has the Duke of Wellington, has the Prime Minister holding the first state paper she signed. One big mistake. Because they're all wearing dark colours, Wilkie put her in white, uh, which she could have worn for mourning, but she actually wore black, and the dress survives, in fact, and she wasn't best pleased. Um, you know, she could notice details, and she certainly noticed which colour she should be wearing. By the time of Victoria's accession, Kensington was no longer the monarch's official residence. She was only to spend a couple more weeks at her childhood home before moving to Buckingham Palace. She records in her diary the sadness that she felt leaving her poor palace. It had been a place of special memories, and none more so than her first meeting with Albert of Saxe-Coburg, which took place here in 1836. Now, of course, the palace is most closely identified with Diana, Princess of Wales, and the extraordinary events that followed her death in 1997.
Even now, a day does not pass without someone leaving a plant to pay tribute. The palace is still a royal home and is where the Duke and Duchess of Gloucester and Prince and Princess Michael of Kent live. But London's royal palaces are not confined to the centre of the capital. Following the River Thames west from the capital, one arrives at Hampton Court, a truly spectacular palace. One of the most striking features of Hampton Court today is this magnificent clock. It was installed by Henry VIII in 1540 as part of his remodelling of the palace, which removed all traces of its previous owner. The Hampton Court was not built by Henry, but by one of his most trusted friends and advisers, Thomas Wolsey. Wolsey was the king's right-hand man and most trusted advisor. When Wolsey built Hampton Court, he placed a huge set of his coat of arms here above the entrance to the palace. Henry VIII made it his prime task, as soon as he took control of the palace, to totally remove all traces of Wolsey's stay. Laborers worked by torchlight day and night under huge canvas cloths. They defaced Wolsey's arms over the entrance and above them installed the astronomical clock. The clock itself is fascinating. As well as telling the hour, day, month and phases of the moon, it also tells the time of high tide at London Bridge. Another feature is in the clock face. The sun revolves around the Earth because the clock was designed before the discoveries of Galileo. The reason for all this Tudor vandalism is quite simple. Within the space of six months, the two men had completely fallen out. Wolsey descended from being the most powerful minister in the kingdom to being tried for treason. Both Hampton Court and Wolsey had humble origins. In the 13th century, the palace had been a manor owned by the Knights Hospitallers of St. John of Jerusalem. A succession of manor houses followed until, in 1514, Thomas Wolsey bought the lease. Well, Wolsey was an extraordinary character because really he came, almost came from nowhere. Um, he came from Ipswich, um, where his later critics said he was the son of a butcher, that his father was a, an Ipswich grazier. And he joined the church, which was the opening for anybody who wanted to get on in those days, become a churchman. Um, and he joined the household at an early age of Henry VII. But his real break came with the accession of Henry VIII. He soon recognised that in Wolsey he, he had somebody who would take on the burden of, of running, essentially running the state. Wolsey became indispensable to the king. He became very powerful, he became very rich, and he incurred, eventually incurred the jealousy of the king. He built what was a very great house indeed, a rival to anything, anything the king owned. Wolsey lived here in, in immense style, and it was quite clearly a rival to anything that happened any, at any of, the, um, any of the courts of Europe. Uh, it was on a courtly scale. Rumours of Wolsey's lifestyle prompted the king to ask him why he had built a palace that far outshone his own at nearby Richmond. Wolsey reputedly replied, to show how noble a place a subject may offer his sovereign. These turned out to be prophetic words. Soon after, the lease of Hampton Court was given to the king, and in return the cardinal was allowed the use of Richmond Palace. In fact, they shared the two. Well, the fallout was catastrophic, but it took a long time. Um, and Henry was very reluctant, even at the very end, to lose the services of the minister, who was, was quite exceptionally able. And I think that the real problem began with um, Anne Boleyn. She bore a grudge against Wolsey, uh, and that had a very serious effect on um, the king's view of the minister. I think his decline, in a large measure, can be attributed to her influence over the king, trying to drive a wedge between these two individuals who had previously worked very, very closely together. He lost Hampton Court, he was deprived of various offices, and he retreated to, he retreated northwards to York. He lived in some style in York, and that was reported back to the king. And by this time, the king was suspicious of what Wolsey was up to, and so officers were sent north to arrest him. Uh, Wolsey travelled south, he got as far as Leicester, he stayed in Leicester Abbey, uh, and that's in fact where he died, um, en route back to London, where almost certainly he would have been tried for treason with the usual uh, Tudor result. One problem of coping with a household of five or six hundred is ensuring an adequate supply of fresh water. One of the features of Wolsey's palace was an elaborate water supply system, but Henry had to extend it further. After only a short stay, the court would leave and not return to the palace until it had been made hospitable again. 
With a supply of fresh water, larger amounts of people could stay for longer periods in one place. Wolsey had already introduced a system of water conduits, but Henry needed to improve on it. He constructed further conduit houses at Coombe, three miles from here, so that fresh water could flow downhill from Kingston to the palace. 100 pounds were set aside for construction. Three miles of pipes using 150 tons of lead took the water via Kingston under the Thames to Hampton Court. King Conduit is still in working order, although it hasn't supplied water to Hampton Court since 1876. Many of the original pipes still run under the houses of Kingston. At the time when the water system was being improved, Kingston was already a busy and prosperous market town. Although it is the oldest of the three royal boroughs in England, it was not until 1927 that King George V confirmed the title. It was given in recognition of Kingston's royal heritage, for it was here that the ancient Saxon kings were crowned. Edward the Elder was the first to be made king here in 900, and the last was Ethelred the Unready in 979. The coronation stone is thought to be the remains of the ancient throne upon which they sat. A silver coin from the reign of each king is set into the stone plinth. It is likely that the actual coronation service would have taken place in the chapel, which once stood on the site of All Saints Church. Then the king would be crowned in the open air for the public to see. From the towers of the church, there is a great view of the river, and in the 16th century, the bell ringers were paid to welcome Queen Elizabeth I as she passed by on the river on her way to Hampton Court. It is also recorded that they were paid not to ring the bells when her successor, James I, passed by, as he was not so popular. Kingston Bridge has also played an important role in the fortunes of the town. Along with London Bridge, it was one of the only two bridges across the Thames from medieval times. It has been rebuilt over the centuries, but during the 16th century, it was deliberately destroyed by the locals. They were trying to prevent the passage of Sir Thomas Wyatt and his followers, who were fighting to stop the marriage of Mary I to the King of Spain in 1554. The citizens managed to stall him for several hours, which helped towards Wyatt's eventual defeat. As a sign of gratitude, Queen Mary granted the town a charter, allowing them a third fish weir and an additional fair. It is said that there was such an abundance of salmon that even the workhouse complained of being fed too much. This prosperous trade is represented in the town's coat of arms, along with a crown to indicate its royal status. Mary's father, Henry VIII, used Kingston Bridge for his artillery train, as he feared for the safety of London Bridge under the excessive weight. The king's procession also crossed it on its way to France in 1520, and the field of the cloth of gold. In 1546, Henry was again entertaining French ambassadors. This time, Hampton Court was the venue, and the palace was surrounded with gold and velvet tents. For six days, they housed the ambassador's retinue of 200 gentlemen and the 1,300 members of Henry's own court. This sort of event was not unusual, and to meet such demands, the palace kitchens were immense. They were divided into 19 separate apartments, overseeing all aspects of the royal menu. In Wolsey's time and in Henry VIII's time, the, the ceremonial centre of the palace was, was the Great Hall. But what is interesting is that by the 1530s, the emphasis on Great Hall, um, in general terms, was, was declining. Uh, and at Hampton Court, it's something of a revival of what Henry viewed as the great medieval tradition of having a Great Hall. And one can imagine him harking back to, to Henry V, the great medieval uh, royal heroes, and having this huge baronial, uh, baronial hall in the middle of his, middle of his palace. Um, but it was there that the, the lower courtiers, at least, dined, um, hundreds and hundreds of them, up to 600 at a sitting, um, up, to, up to twice a day. During the reign of Elizabeth I, the Great Hall was often used as a theater, featuring sumptuous costumes and scenery. Ingenious lighting effects were created, and on one occasion, artificial snow was produced. The palace was also the scene for real-life dramas, several of which include Henry VIII and his successive wives. He spent three out of his six honeymoons here, including the one with the young Anne Boleyn, 
He had their entwined initials carved throughout the palace. As soon as she fell from grace, these were rapidly changed to J for his next wife, Jane Seymour. The work was undertaken with great haste and many were missed, so the initials of Henry and Anne still remain inseparable to this day. Jane Seymour gave Henry his much wanted son and heir. Edward VI was christened here in the chapel with much pomp and ceremony. He was carried beneath a rich canopy in a great procession, but only a few days later, Jane Seymour died following complications with the birth. The joyful celebrations within the palace were brought to an abrupt halt. A Bible still stands open as it did in the day of Henry VIII, when he insisted that all visitors should be able to enter any church and read a Bible in English. The book today is the authorized King James Version of 1611, which was conceived at Hampton Court. Henry would take mass and daily prayer in the Holy Day closet overlooking the chapel. It was while in here that he chose to ignore the screams for mercy from his fifth wife, Catherine Howard. It was a tragic end to what had been a promising new beginning for the king. Henry and Catherine were married in a quiet ceremony at Hampton Court, but she was young and he was old. She soon preferred the company, rather unwisely, of some of her former lovers. These included Thomas Culpepper. It was not long before reports were leaked to the king of Thomas being smuggled into the queen's apartments. At first, Henry would not believe it and was devastated by the news. A public declaration of the queen's adultery was made in the great watching chamber, and her household was immediately dismissed. The queen was arrested and held captive at the palace. Catherine felt that if she could only talk to the king, she would be able to persuade him of her honor and save her skin. But she was forbidden from seeing him. This frustration and the fear of following the same fate as her cousin, Anne Boleyn, drove her to take desperate action. Familiar with the king's routine, she knew when he would be in the chapel. This was only a short distance from where she was being held. She managed to break away from her guards and ran as fast as she could down the corridor towards the chapel doors. She hammered at the door, pleading with the king to let her in. It stayed firmly shut. The guards seized her and dragged her screaming back to her quarters. The next time she left her rooms was to start her journey to the tower and then to the block. She was beheaded on the 13th of February, 1542. She was just 20 years old. The eerie sound of Catherine's supposed shrieks and moans have been heard so often in this corridor that it has been renamed the Haunted Gallery. William III and Mary II were the next monarchs to change the fate of Hampton Court. Sir Christopher Wren was chosen to completely renovate the now run-down Tudor Palace. They had grandiose plans for the old palace, but cash flow was a problem and many of their dreams were compromised. Fountain Court, which replaced Henry VIII's courtyard, was one of the very few aspects that was completed exactly as they had wished. In many ways, their palace, I suspect, didn't quite go as far as their ambitions. They, at, at uh, Hampton Court, what they proposed to do was demolish the entire palace, with the exception of the Great Hall. Um, and that, as a nucleus for a grand Baroque palace, was their initial intention. However, I'm afraid that uh, reality struck, and what we see now at Hampton Court is a reduced version of that initial uh, intention. William and Mary are the only monarchs in British history to rule as joint heads of state. As the daughter of James II, Mary was Parliament's first choice, but her husband, William of Orange, refused to go to England unless he was given equal status with Mary. William and Mary began their work on Hampton Court in 1689. Five years and millions of pounds later, it was still not completed. Then, long before her rooms at the palace were finished, Queen Mary died suddenly of smallpox. The king was devastated by her death, and all work halted for three years. When work resumed again, he oversaw it with attention to the smallest detail, making hundreds of his own suggestions along the way. As well as the buildings, William and Mary paid great attention to the grounds surrounding the palace. 
In fact, the gardens became so well known that the king and queen were acknowledged as two of the greatest gardeners in Europe. They experimented with rare and exotic plants from all around the world. Mary would send collectors to the Canary Islands in Virginia to gather native samples. These were then kept in specially built hothouses at the palace. All the loving care William showed his grounds was sadly ironic. This was where he was out riding when his horse stumbled on a molehill and threw the king from his saddle. He broke his collarbone and retired to Kensington Palace to convalesce. He died from pneumonia three weeks later. The next and last monarch to use Hampton Court as a home was George II. He added to and refurbished the palace for his Queen Caroline and also for their eight children. But all was not domestic bliss. The king and queen were not fond of their eldest son, Frederick, Prince of Wales. The queen was quoted as calling him the greatest ass and the greatest liar and the greatest beast in the whole world. The final straw came when he was expecting his first child with his third wife, Augusta of Saxe-Gotha. At first, Frederick tried to keep the pregnancy secret, but when the queen found out, she insisted on being present at the birth. She did not believe that her son could father a healthy child and wanted to make sure that a changeling wasn't put in its place. The prince and princess were staying at Hampton Court with the king and queen when the princess went into labor. Frederick dragged his poor wife out of the palace to go to St. James's. When the queen was told of their departure, she set off in hot pursuit, but did not arrive in time to see the child born. She met with a chilly reception and returned to the king saying, I hope to God I never have to see him again. Her wish was granted. Queen Caroline died two months later without a reconciliation. After Queen Caroline's death, the palace was not used as a royal home again. It was divided into grace and favor apartments, and there are still residents today who keep Hampton Court as a living home. One survivor of the palace's sporting heritage is the Royal Tennis Court. Royal or real tennis has been played in England since the 14th century and predates lawn tennis by almost 600 years. Henry VIII was an accomplished athlete and loved to play the game. The king had the first covered court built here in 1532. Hampton Court is full of echoes of its rich history and close links with the crown. Whether it be tennis or ghostly screams, its gardens or the grace and favor apartments. But it's perhaps ironic that there is no trace at all of Thomas Wolsey, the man who built it and was responsible for it becoming a royal palace.